Now, please turn to the Bible tonight. I want to bring to you a little message, beginning with the second chapter of Luke, please. Uh, If you don't have a Bible, just listen carefully to the reading. The second chapter of the Gospel by Luke. I want to read quite a number of varied verses, but make comments just briefly upon them. Luke chapter 2, and this is the chapter that speaks about the birth of the Lord Jesus. But further down the chapter, we have this man called Simeon. Verse 25, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And then they bring the child in. And uh, notice, please, at verse number 33. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold this child. I want you to notice that little expression, please. Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, and a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also. Now, I'll come back to that later in in our thoughts. But turn over now, please, to the Gospel by John, chapter 19. John, chapter 19. I might go back and forward a little, but it's mainly because of the order of the readings that I want to mention. John chapter 19, and uh, the early part of this chapter, we have Christ brought out to be crucified. Chapter 19 of John, and uh, verse number 4, Pilate therefore went forth again, and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto them, Behold, the man. Now further down this chapter, verse 13, When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew Gabbatha, and it was about the it was the preparation of the Passover, and about the sixth hour, and he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. Now back in this same gospel to chapter one, to a well known text in chapter one of John, and then I want to read two more verses. John chapter one and verse twenty nine. John 1, verse 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. What a wonderful statement of truth that is. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Now back to the Gospel by Matthew, please, for a verse or two in chapter 25. Matthew 25 And we will read just a a little section of this parable of the ten virgins. Matthew 25, and uh, we have the, the wise and the foolish virgins, the five each of them, ten in total. Verse 4 says, But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. And you know how some were received in to the banquet and others were closed out. Now finally turn over to the book of James, please, and the fifth chapter of the book of James. James 5 and verse number Eight, the eighth verse of James 5. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. 
Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Now that is our reading, as I say, is quite lengthy, more than usual. Two or three weeks ago, I made a little note of these points that I have been reading here, and uh, I never had noted them down before. They were fresh to my mind, but I just put them aside, keeping in mind the meeting here today. Uh, so it's uh, a new little uh, theme that I have in mind to speak to you about for a few minutes. And that is to take a look at the person of Christ. If you like, we will just be having uh, around six great sights of the Lord Jesus in these uh, verses that we have been reading. And they all follow a pattern which is quite uh, distinctive. And that is uh, the idea of beholding. It's a lovely old uh, English King James Bible uh, word, behold. We don't use it so much nowadays in our modern uh, speaking of English, but there's something very lovable and very precious about this well-known old archaic word, behold. And we're going to just go through these one by one uh, on this particular Lord's Day. And I trust, dear friends, that the simple presentation of Christ will bring blessing to your precious soul. After all, there's something far more important here today than the holiday season or festivities, presents, parties, eating, friends and family. All of those things have their place but there's something that will outlive all those things. And that will be your relationship with the Lord Jesus and your position before God for all eternity. So we want, whilst keeping in mind the season of the year, we also have to remember the most important and the most vital uh, part of our meeting here today is what you do with Christ as your Savior, as he's presented to you today. Now, number one, we have this wonderful little statement, Behold this child. I'll just mention them here and you'll know where we're going. Behold the child, Luke chapter 2. I just call that his coming. Behold this child. And as Simeon lifted up the child, he had just arrived into the world, his coming. Then you slip over into John 19 and you have, Behold the man. And you couldn't read those verses without thinking about his character. Pilate brought him forth to show that there was no fault in him. And he says, Behold the man. Echo homo. Behold the man. His character. But then we have, Behold the lamb. And there will be no gospel meeting at all without this. This great uh, element in the, in the flow of what is before me. We have in John 1, 29, Behold the Lamb of God. That's his cross. And we should always remember that Bethlehem was just a stepping stone to Calvary. It was the means by which he came into the world to finally go to the cross at Calvary. And so we have, behold, the Lamb, and that is, of course, his cross. But then fourthly, behold the bridegroom. Matthew 25. And you can't think about a bridegroom without thinking about his companion. Christ will have a companion. And every safe person in the room here today and every believer across the whole world is part of that great companion, the bride that he loves and the bride that he's coming for. 
Christ is returning. Behold the bridegroom, his companion. We would all who are saved here today love to think that everyone here uh, very soon, even today, that you'll be part of that great number associated with Christ as his companion for all eternity. Then we read another statement in John. Behold your king. That's his crown. Or if you like, it's his claims. The Lord Jesus is king. Pilate saith unto them, Behold your king. And he is the king. Thank God he is. And he's coming to reign. And then, last of all, I think number six, Behold the judge. James chapter 5. That's his condemnation. And that's the context of that passage in James 5, where James is writing and he says, be patient. He says there may be people doing wrong. There may be a world of fraud and uh, greed and uh, people that are not fair with money and they're corrupt and so forth. But he says now there's condemnation coming. He says, be patient. Behold, the judge is at the door. So you can see my outline, and I hope that the little points simply set out there will be remembered. Now we begin with the Lord Jesus as the child. Behold, this child. Is it not a marvelous thing that the everlasting Lord, the Son of God, eternal, that he was found lying in a manger, and uh, after a few days brought to the temple to be presented and to be named and so on. And Simeon, the old man, lifted him up in his arms and said, Behold, mine eyes have seen thy salvation. He says, I, I'm ready now to die. Now that I have seen him, now that my eyes have seen God's salvation, I have no other desire. There's nothing else that is... Uh, Pressing, I'm ready to leave. And uh, that's for the, of course, that uh, song and uh, in classical music and so on, and it's often recited at this time of the year, Nunt Dimittus, now ready to depart. And it comes from these, one of these five songs in the early nativity scenes of the coming into the world of Christ. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And he came as the babe. And imagine that little child. Yet, dear friends, no less almighty at his birth than on his throne supreme. His shoulders held up heaven and earth while Mary held up him. And we love to think about it. That in that small compass that anyone could lift easily, you have uh, the very essence of deity. Uh, Christ himself, the child born, the son given. Behold this child. You ever ask yourself why he came? You ever wonder, dear friends, about the mystery of the incarnation, that the Lord Jesus would come so far, given by God, to step into the world? You know, the only time we often speak about the door of uh, uh, time opening and letting us into eternity. And we speak often about people leaving this world for eternity through the door of death. But there was one time when that door opened inwardly and from eternity there stepped into time the, the maker of heaven and earth. The Lord Jesus came. See what small room my infant Lord doth take whom all the world is not enough to hold. Who of his years or of his age hath told? Never such age so young, never a child so old. And whenever Simeon lifted up that little infant, he was lifting up one who predated the earth. He was eternal in his being, never had a beginning. It's a wonderful thing that Christ Jesus came. Behold this child. It's touching, isn't it? And yet... I may say that at this time of the year, the Christmas season, so many will be uh, celebrating uh, in some way or another this time of year, but how few 
really uh, ponder the reason why he came. How few realize that this man came, this person, to save my soul from hell. There won't be very many people in the city of Belfast tonight in their festivities or London or anywhere else will ponder over the very deep meaning of this, that the reason why the babe lay in the manger and the child was lifted up by Simeon, the reason why he is there at all is because the world needs a saviour and our sins have left us bankrupt and lost and we needed him to come and down from the glory the saviour came down to the cross and the death of shame thank god he ever came i love to sing that old hymn in fact i i remember singing it as a lad out in the fields I often say, I'm sure the birds wondered what kind of a, a creature was adding to the chorus. Uh, it's that lovely old hymn, I have a friend whose faithful love is more than all the world to me. Higher than the heights above and deeper than the soundless sea. So old, so new, so strong, so true. Before the earth received its frame, he loved me. Blessed be his name. And it goes on to say, he held the highest place above. Adored by all the sons of flame, yet such as self-denying love, he laid aside his crown and came to seek the lost. And at the cost of heavenly rank and earthly fame, he sought me, blessed be his name. I think when I meet that hymn writer in heaven, I'll shake his hand and thank him for those lovely words that he wrote. Do you know this Savior? Let me start here right at the very front of both sides of the, the hall here today. On Christmas Eve, can I ask you plainly, is your soul saved? Is your name in heaven's book? If you died before the end of the year, is it heaven or hell? These are the serious things. Right to the back of the building here today, leaving aside all the trivialities, are you right with God? Is all well? Are your sins forgiven? Is Christ a real person to you? Or is it only a story that you read in a book? There are many here today, and we love him because he first loved us. Our souls are thrilled at the very mention of his name. And we're glad he ever came and was the child. Behold, this child is coming. Then, secondly, the child became the man, of course. He grew up. Thank God he came to grow and become the very perfect specimen of humanity. And as Pilate brought him forth that day in John 19, I want to tell you, he stood in all his dignity, a sinless savior. You know, there's nobody here in this room is sinless. There's absolutely nobody here can claim a perfect record. In fact, dear friends, every man and woman here, every boy and girl, if all our sins were exposed, we would be embarrassed. And if you, if you realize today a fraction of the guilt of your life, you would tremble and shudder before a holy God. It's terrible to think about our sins. And yet there's so many. It's, it's a dreadful thing to think about how defiled we are in thought and word and deed. And the world doesn't help it. Everywhere you look today, sin is encouraged and promoted and incited and uh, stir up those desires, those wrong desires, the greed and covetousness, the, the, the desire for what is wrong and all those jealousies and bitternesses and all the things that come with humanity and all the violence. You know, this day that we are here gathered in peace. Don't forget that the world is in a bad way. I want to tell you, you take about the, talk about wars and the violence in, the, in Europe and the Middle East and the, the, the boiling of, of uh, uh, all the, the, the troubles and the, the, the deaths and cruelty. It's, a, it's an awful picture. It's an awful world we're in. And that's one of the reasons I'm so glad that 2023 has seen a lot of people saved. Some of our brethren were telling me that he knew of 70 souls. That's even amongst those that we know of 
amongst our preaching brethren that have been saved in 2023. God's mighty hand has been stretched out in salvation time and again this year. It's encouraging for Christians to pray on. And if there's anybody here today not saved, and there are some, I want to tell you, you could be saved. And you could be saved before the day's over. There's power in the gospel. All it takes is for you to bow in repentance and acknowledge that you're lost and that you need this man, this sinless man. He's so different from all the rest of us. We're all lost. It really touches my heart today to think about the state of our hearts by nature. The ruin is desperate and deep and depraving and desperate and defiling. And I want to tell you, if we think that, what more does God think of it? The only one who really sees it and all his desperateness is God himself. But Christ stood that day and Pilate says, Behold the man, behold the man, his character, flawless, sinless, inwardly and outwardly, privately and publicly. Isn't it not a, a tremendous thought that from those days when Simeon lifted him up in his arms, there hadn't been one sin committed from the day as a boy, an infant, from that moment in the temple, not one thought of wrong, not one discrepancy, not one aberration was committed by that sinless person. And after 30 years, his mother said, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Imagine a mother that never saw a boy sinning, never had to correct him, never had, to. we don't have many boys like that, I tell you. Any that are around our place weren't like that. But imagine a boy raised in a home. And in fact, instead of the mother and father condemning him, his holiness condemned them. Let me go a stage further to number three and think about his cross. Behold the Lamb. You see, every time here that, that we're pointing you to Christ, dear friend, it's, it's a matter of getting your eyes fixed on him. Behold the man. Now behold the Lamb. And the Lamb of God was slain on Calvary's cross. How is it that people get saved? Let's get down to business here just for a minute, very simply. How is it that you and I, as sinners in this world, weak and helpless, guilty and defiled, how is it that we can never be right with God? That's the point. How is it we can never be in heaven, that land of fadeless, unsullied light, that you need a, a pure nature to enjoy, never mind get into? How would it ever be that souls like ourselves can never be so cleansed and our guilt removed? That's the big question. Well, the cross is the answer. Because God can save, yet righteous be. And the, 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 the solution is found. Now listen to it all very carefully, friends. Please listen to me just now. Give it an extra year. Not too long ago, there was a young girl sitting in a meeting. And uh, as I illustrated this very thing to her, she got saved right on the spot. I didn't know about her for a couple of days. But I just was demonstrating this matter of, of the gospel in a very simple way. Take it that this is you, the sinner. Just imagine this wooden platform. You're here. Or me, because we're all included. We're all on the same platform by nature. This is me, the sinner. Here's a holy God with his wrath abiding over me. And that wrath would fall upon the sinner and righteously. Not a word of blame could be laid against God, not a charge. God so holy, inexplicably holy. And his wrath abiding, John 3, 36, the wrath of God abideth on him. Here's me, the sinner. What can ever be done? God must be righteous. What he does is he sends his son. And on this cross that we're talking about, behold the Lamb of God. 
that precious Lamb of God steps in, bears the wrath. The judgment fell on Jesus' head. The wrath I deserve. And if I, as the sinner, accept the substitute, I go free. The wrath has fallen. And upon believing, God says, the guilt is gone. That sinner has received my offer of salvation in my beloved son. That sinner has accepted the provision of Calvary. And the wrath of God that was my due upon the lamb was laid. And by the shedding of his blood, the debt for me is paid. I go free. I think it's a marvelous and simple demonstration of the gospel. Of course, it depends upon your response. It depends upon whether you accept it. Because if you don't accept Christ as your Savior, you'll bear your own wrath, and the judgment will fall upon you. But God is offering a substitute. God is offering to the whole world today a Savior who on the cross, as God's Lamb, died for us. I like the words of the old poem the Scotchman wrote, Upon a life I did not live, upon a death that I did not die. Upon another's life and death I stake my whole eternity. Dear friends, a cross is the answer to your need today. If you're here in the meeting and you would love to be saved and you would love to enjoy uh, this holiday season, the peace of God in your soul, I want to tell you, you can have it by trusting Christ as your personal Savior. I've never believed that salvation is difficult. We make it difficult. I'm sure that God has made it as simple so that a boy of six or seven could get it, or a little child, to grasp by simple faith, I need a Savior, I'm perishing, if I miss him I'll go to hell. But God sent a son to die on Calvary for me, and I will receive the merits of his death for me on that cross, and I'll accept him who died in my place. And if you do, what you're really doing is you're saying amen and agreeing with God. You're accepting God's provision. Are you hearing me now? This is all what's involved in salvation. The man in the Old Testament who sinned, he brought his offering through the middle of the day, through the camp of Israel, led an animal. The animal was killed. Its blood was shed. But before all that, his hand was laid upon the head of the animal. And so to speak, he was saying, this animal is dying in my place. And my guilt is being transferred to this innocent victim. And God accepted that sacrifice in the stead of the sinner. It's as clear as crystal. And it carries right through to the New Testament, where God's Lamb is upon a cross to die for us. Dear friends, behold the Lamb today. Take a look at God's lamb. Rest your soul upon his person. And God will save your soul for all eternity. I hope you're interested in that just at this very moment. The wrath falling upon him who never deserved it. But because he accepted it and paid the price and penalty on our behalf, we go free. And salvation is ours without money and without price. Behold the bridegroom. Christ is coming back. I've never been assured that Christ is returning and returning at any moment. The bridegroom is awaiting the bride. And whenever the last soul is saved that will believe the gospel, the church will be complete. And the bridegroom will come, rise from his seat at God's right hand. He will come He'll take away his people. The church will be gone in a moment of time. The days that we're living in are very, very dark. The stage is being set for the return of Christ. I mean for the, to the earth. To deal again with Israel. They're all fighting about Palestine and the possession of the land. Now, but I want to tell you, the Prince of Peace is coming. And when he comes, he will bring the solution 
to that whole land problem and the whole world problem. Jesus shall reign where'er the sun doth its successive journeys run. His kingdom stretched from shore to shore till moon shall wax and wane no more. I love the very thought of it. He's coming, but he's coming first as the bridegroom. And when he does come, he'll take away all the Christians. Imagine a world with not one Christian left in it. Nobody to pray for you. A hall, but no preaching. Bibles everywhere, but no salvation. It could happen, and it will. Robert Murray McShane of Scotland was preaching one night on the coming of the Lord. And a man came in afterwards and said, spoke a few words to him. And the preacher said, do you think the Lord will come tonight? The man replied, I don't think so. And the preacher said, in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. We're losing this in our minds. Our lives are so busy, we hardly believe the Lord's coming. We have a blind spot spiritually. We're taken up with earth. Our pegs are deep. We're worried about life and finance and families and education. And it's all legitimate in its own way. Very much so. But it's very important to remember that the bridegroom is coming. Behold the bridegroom. And the door was shut. And everybody that wasn't ready, they were outside forever. Behold your king, his crown. Christ is coming as king. There have been many, many people have assumed to be leaders and wanted to be rulers and dictators in this world. But none of them have the credentials of leadership that God demands. There's only one king in a true sense, and the Lord is coming back as king. King of the Jews, he was called in John 19. Israel today largely are secular in their outlook. Only a few are believers in the true Messiah. But the king is coming, and when he does, there will be a, a little group, a remnant there. All that's left of the nation will be there, according to Romans chapter 11. And they will receive him. They'll be waiting for him. And when he comes, they'll accept him. All Israel shall be saved, according to that verse. All who are there in the land, just pressed and troubled and afflicted to the nth degree. But suddenly, the brightness of the Son of Man's appearing will signal the end of the tribulation. And a nation will be born in a day. Glorious days are coming when the true king arrives. Where will you be in that day? Some of the old men used to sing the old hymn, when he comes in bright array and leads the conquering line, it will be glory then to say that he's a friend of mine. Behold your king, his crown. Behold the judge. Point number six. Oh, he is the judge. He's going to put right all the wrongs of earth. I wonder how many here will stand before the judge. How many here will stand without any shelter and without any safety. It's a solemn thing. Our brother Tom Bentley used to tell about a Sunday school teacher in Belfast that he knew well as a boy. That Sunday school teacher wasn't saved until he was in his twenties. He was a wild young fella into all kinds of trouble. So bad he wanted to finish his life. He himself was raised in a Sunday school. And he went up one day to the Cave Hill. Most of you know where the Cave Hill is. Napoleon's nose looks over the city and he had with him a bottle of substance that would soon have ended his life and he stood at the top of Cave Hill 
about to finish himself. And they took the cork out of the bottle. And suddenly, there came into his mind the words that he learned as a boy in Sunday school. It is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. And he threw the bottle down, was convicted of his sins, and went down home, a penitent, repentant sinner, trusted Christ as a Savior, became a valued brother in service for God, teaching Sunday school children and other things. Don't forget, dear friend, there's an afterwards. After this, the judgment. Behold the judge. The crucial thing now as I close is this. What are you going to do with Christ? We're going to sing about it. What a wonderful day, 24th December this year, it would be if some precious soul long prayed for in Ballyclare would just throw down all resistance And with honesty of soul and with a purpose to change your life, you'll receive Christ right now as your personal Savior before this day is over. Why not? Only the devil tells you that you can't do it. Only the devil says not today. It can't be. You didn't intend to be saved today. Sure it's Christmas. Enjoy yourself and forget about it. That's all the voice of the evil one. I want to tell you, your soul will be enraptured and thrilled. If you got the Savior today, you'll be the happiest person in the whole place. May God grant you'll trust him. Put your confidence in him personally. and Receive him as your Lord and Savior. Behold Christ, six sights of the Savior. May God bless you and bless his precious word. Shall we pray? Our Father, Thou knowest that we have sought to speak well of thy Son. We thank thee for him, and we are glad of the great salvation and forgiveness that he provides. But we pray that others here may soon receive him and know the joy of sins forgiven and peace and a prospect in heaven. Take us all away safely now and bless thy word and bless the people. Preserve every one we pray of thee safely and grant our God that every one here in this place today younger or older, when all is over as far as earth is concerned. Grant that everyone will be inside those four walls of heaven and uh, saved and sheltered by the blood of the Lamb. Hear as we pray and receive our thanks. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.